All right, welcome back everyone. We're now in session two. So this is another observational skill session. The first one was radiography and this one is going to be chest CT, the highest volume study that we have. So we have a number of awesome lectures for you. The first one is going to be a recording. This is from Phil Boisel from the Frank H. Netter MD School of Medicine and the topic is large airways disease. Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Phil Boisel from the Netter School of Medicine at Quinnipiac University. Today I'm glad to be part of this STR resident boot camp and I'm pleased to share with you large airways disease, what every resident needs to know. I have three objectives today. One is to review normal CT anatomy of the large airways. Second, to talk about a pattern-based approach and to use some cases to help illustrate that. And third, to help you to provide meaningful radiology reports, particularly regarding the large airways. So let's start by thinking about our tracheal anatomy. As you know, the trachea extends from the inferior cricoid cartilage to the carina. There's a wide variation in normal health of the different dimensions of the trachea, but a helpful rule of thumb is that in normal, healthy individuals, the normal tracheal lumen has a one-to-one -one ratio of the coronal to sagittal diameter. This means that the shape of the trachea and inspiration is typically gonna be round or oval. Let's also think about tracheal wall anatomy. As you know, the anterior and lateral walls of the trachea are composed of 16 to 22 C-shaped cartilaginous rings, which are relatively inflexible. Now, in contrast to that, the posterior membranous wall is more flexible. And so that's going to have an implication on what the trachea looks like at both inspiration and end expiration. So as we see on these paired inspiratory and end expiratory CT scans, on the left, we have an oval-shaped appearance, which is typical at inspiration. But on the expiratory scan, that posterior membranous wall has moved forward uh, creating a flattened posterior wall and an overall horseshoe shape. In some patients, there may be actual anterior bowing of the posterior membranous wall. Now, when we evaluate the trachea, in addition to uh, looking at its shape, we want to look at its size, whether it's dilated or narrowed, and we want to look into the lumen to see if there are any endoluminal abnormalities. So let's start with size. And another good rule of thumb to have in terms of measurements is that the tracheal lumen should not measure more than 2.5 centimeters in diameter in an adult patient. So anything greater than that is the definition of tracheomegaly, which can be congenital, as in this rare case of Mooney-Aitken syndrome, and is more commonly acquired in patients with chronic lung disease, such as this patient with interstitial lung abnormality. Narrowing of the trachea can be either focal or diffuse, and focal narrowing can be quite difficult to fully characterize on axial images alone. So keep in mind, you may want to look at the coronal reformation images in cases of known or suspected focal narrowing. One of the more common causes of focal narrowing is post-intubation stenosis. And then uh, also think about, importantly, um, more common than that, extrinsic causes of focal narrowing, such as from enlarged thyroid gland or from uh, vascular structures. So here's an example of a patient with focal intrinsic narrowing that we just saw in the axial CT image. And here's an example of extrinsic compression, in this case from an enlarged thyroid gland, which is rendered in red. In addition to looking for narrowing, you wanna carefully look at the wall of the trachea for thickness. So, and remember the rule of thumb there is that the normal tracheal thickness is about one to two millimeters. In this case, we have pretty uh, grossly evident circumferential wall thickening, which creates a cheerio type of appearance. And on the multiplanar reformation image, we actually see an hourglass configuration of the tracheal narrowing. And that's very typical of post-intubation stenosis. Now, when you're looking at tracheal wall thickening, if it doesn't have that cheerio type of appearance, and it's actually sparing the posterior membranous wall, as it does in this case, 
then you should really be thinking about diseases that target the cartilage. And in this case, the anterolateral wall thickening with calcification is due to relapsing polychondritis. So let's take a look at a case of a patient with diffuse tracheal narrowing. I'll give you a moment to look at the axial image on the left and the coronal reformation image on the right. Um, and you can see in the lung windows that the patient also has emphysema. So let's take a look at the findings together. So on the axial image, we see a narrow coronal diameter and an elongated sagittal or AP diameter. The coronal image shows us that the intrathoracic trachea is diffusely involved, but there's sparing of the extrathoracic trachea. I'll give you just a moment to come up with a diagnosis. And I'm sure many of you got this right. This is a saber sheath trachea, strongly associated with COPD and characteristically spares the extrathoracic trachea. As I mentioned, in addition to looking for dilation and narrowing, we want to look carefully at the lumen of the trachea for any endotracheal lesions. And in this case, we have a irregularly marginated polypoid lesion arising from the right anterior lateral wall of the trachea with some associated wall thickening. Uh, let's look at these findings together. So endoluminal mass and no associated uh, mediastinal lymphadenopathy. And importantly, we don't see any contiguous enlargement of adjacent uh, thoracic structures, such as a thyroid gland or esophagus. So this is in fact a primary tracheal neoplasm. Um, as you may know, the majority of these are malignant in adults. This happened to be a squamous cell carcinoma, which is associated with cigarette smoking. Other things to think about other than this diagnosis uh, would particularly be tracheal invasion by an extra tr tr tracheal malignancy, but we didn't see any evidence of enlarged uh, masses coming from the esophagus or thyroid gland or other structures, including the lungs. One other thing to think about though is retained tracheal secretions. So um, most typically they appear as they are in this image as dependent opacities with uh, gas bubbles in them, but sometimes they can adhere to non-dependent areas of the tracheal uh, wall. And in those cases, you can just do limited uh, repeat imaging after coughing. And here is such a case where we have a polypoid lesion uh, from the right lateral wall of the trachea that disappeared completely after a coughing maneuver. I mentioned secondary invasion as being an important thing to think about when you see focal uh, tracheal wall thickening and narrowing or an intraluminal mass, and um, always look at the adjacent structures carefully. So we've reviewed the trachea, including some normal anatomy review. We talked about dilation, focal and diffuse narrowing, as well as patterns of wall thickness. Let's transition now to talking about the bronchi. And we'll start again by reviewing our normal anatomy. So the bronchi divide by dichotomous branching. There are 23 generations from the trachea to the alveoli, about eight of which are visible on thin section CT. The bronchi run parallel to the pulmonary arteries, and they're, for all intensive purposes, about the same size as they run in parallel. One of the most important things to look for, similar to the trachea, is an endoluminal lesion. Keep in mind that you can have endobronchial lesions from neoplasms, from broncholithiasis, or from foreign bodies. And both on chest radiographs and CT, sometimes the most dramatic findings are the secondary ones. Post-obstructive air trapping, lobar collapse, mucus plugging, or bronchiectasis. These are two cases of endobronchial lesions of varying sizes. And I'm always uh, reminded humbly of this uh, article by Charlie White about the importance of endobronchial lesions in missed lung cancer diagnoses. And in my own practice, I know that when I've detected endobronchial lesions as the sole abnormality in patients with lung cancer, I've often looked back and found uh, times when that was present previously and, and overlooked because they can be quite subtle at the early presentation. Beyond endoluminal lesions, we also want to look for bronchial narrowing, and this can be either intrinsic or extrinsic. There are a variety of intrinsic causes that range from infections to neoplasms, and depending on the type of uh, setting you're practicing in, you may see focal narrowing 
after a lung transplant, as we're seeing in this particular image. Keep in mind, extrinsic causes can uh, occur from adjacent lymph nodes or masses. One of the most important things we're looking for in the bronchi, and it may be in the indication itself or based on the patient's symptoms, is bronchiectasis. And that's defined as permanent bronchial dilation. Affected patients present with infections, sputum production, cough, and hemoptysis. The read classification of cylindrical to varicoid to cystic bronchiectasis is a very helpful classification pattern. And as we can see on this diagram, cylindrical is non-tapering bronchi, varicoid is herpiginous appearance, and cystic has a very saccular looking appearance. And I'm showing you uh, CT examples of both the varicoid on the left and the cystic pattern on the right. Notice the serpiginous appearance of those dilated bronchi on the left in this patient who's had radiation therapy and the very saccular balloon-like appearance on the right in this patient with cystic fibrosis. There are established CT criteria for bronchiectasis. Um, you just need one or more of these criteria. One include identifying bronchi in a peripheral location. So either a centimeter uh, of the periphery of the lung or actually a budding mediastinal and costal pleura. A lack of tapering of the bronchi is shown here on the right. Keep in mind as the bronchi go from central to peripheral, they should taper and get smaller. And then finally, the bronchoarterial ratio. As these travel in pairs, when the bronchus becomes larger than the artery, you can get this signet ring appearance. Whenever you see a focal distribution of bronchiectasis, you really need to go back carefully and look at the uh, bronchus that's leading to that segment or lobe uh, to make sure that there isn't an endobronchial le neoplasm or other endobronchial lesion like a foreign body or even just a stricture of the bronchus. So anytime you see focal bronchiectasis, always inspect the more proximal airways. And we're gonna close out today's um, session with an unknown case. This is a 65 year old woman who presents with a chronic cough. I'll give you a few moments just to take a look at this image. I want you to look both for any airway abnormalities. And if you see abnormalities, um, what is the distribution of those? And as I'm showing you a single image, uh, it's really kind of what is the, the low bar distribution that you're seeing here. So let's walk through these findings together. So we have signs of bronchiectasis. We have both uh, varicoid appearance of dilated airways as well as lack of bronchial uh, tapering. And um, in this particular image, it seems to be confined to the middle lobe and lingula. And I can tell you the other lobes were not affected by this process. There's also some associated bronchial wall thickening and some central ovular nodules. So here's a differential diagnosis for you. And I ask you to choose one of these diagnoses. One is chronic aspiration, two cystic fibrosis, and three chronic MAC infection. I'll give you a moment to um, choose your diagnosis. And in fact, the answer is here in blue on the left slide. This is a case of chronic atypical mycobacterial infection. So distribution of bronchiectasis can be helpful. And we can think of that from a zonal approach as we're seeing on the left-hand side. So upper lung predominant bronchiectasis, we like to think about cystic fibrosis, sarcoid, and post-radiation fibrosis. Mid-lung region, particularly atypical mycobacterial infection, especially right middle lobe and lingular predominance. And then lower lobe, uh, repeated aspiration and post-infectious. Thinking more centrally, a common cause of central bronchiectasis is allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis. So in summary, always inspect the airways on CT scans. Use a pattern-based approach, thinking about things like airway dilation, airway narrowing, wall thickening, and endoluminal lesions. Avoid pitfalls such as retained secretions. Thank you very much for your attention and it's been a pleasure to be part of the resident boot camp. Thank you.